and rather than making it taste better, it made the crop resistant to a certain kind of weed killer, Monsanto's own. How can you say that GM soya beans are equivalent to non-GM soya beans when they contain a new gene? GM soya contains one additional gene in about, in about 50,000 soya genes. That gene comes from a common soil bacterium. There's also a very small portion of a gene from the petunia plant. We had to ask ourselves whether the presence of these genes and the protein that the soil bacterium gene made made any difference to the safety of the product when it's eaten by people. Um, now, we don't eat soya. We eat the meal, and in making the meal, both the DNA and the protein are, are first of all degraded, and secondly, then very quickly broken right down by the gut and the stomach. So, as it's eaten by the person, they are actually completely equivalent. But some scientists, like geneticist Michael Antonio, disagree. He's done his own experiments on substantial equivalence. My own research tells me that, that these foods cannot be equivalent because it does not fully take into account the fact that genetic modification as applied to agriculture contains an inherent unpredictable component which means that it can produce new toxins and new allergies. So if you go only looking for the things you know are there, you're, you will in all likelihood be missing out on that unknown component that, can be called, that could cause a problem. Opponents of GM foods, like Dr. Antonio, say the new foods should be tested far more extensively. How long did the animal tests you commissioned? No, oh, usually ask? months. Um, but I think one that or long enough? One or two went, went over a year. Was that long enough? Yeah, I think it was. We were long enough to sense anything unpredictable or find out anything? Yes. We were taking the advice of expert toxicologists who are, spend their lives looking for abnormal reactions of the human body to things in the diet. Your critics say just not long enough. You, you should have tested these longer. You know, could test them for 100 years if you want to, or 1,000 years if you want to. At some point, one has to say a reasonable person is satisfied. I, I thought I, we were satisfied. If other people don't, then it's up to them to make their case. This needs to be followed up with feeding trials with human volunteers because something that may come up safe in animals doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be safe for people to eat. Do you think you should have tested these new foods on humans? We knew a great deal about the similarity or difference of these foods from conventional foods, and that's our surest test. But the scientists who wanted long-term animal and human tests had no voice on the Novel Foods Committee. When civil servants and ministers from the last government chose its members, they didn't include anyone opposed to the principle of GM foods. My experience is that if you talk to people who are committed to being against it, you don't make any progress. You, you exchange views, you talk past each other. But our job was to advise ministers whether these foods were safe or not. We were not asked whether we were in favour of the technology. We were asked whether the foods were safe. Not only did the Novel Foods Committee have a narrow remit, it also had little formal contact with other committees advising the government on GM foods. I think all the committees felt that there should be some way where they could get together. They got together sometimes on perhaps a limited topic, but they didn't get together enough, and so there, there were definite gaps. In 1994, the committee, in compliance with its narrow remit, decided the almost natural Monsanto soya beans were safe to put into our food. No critics invited to give evidence, no human trials undertaken. The government took its advice and licensed the GM beans for human consumption. Then something happened that upset almost everyone, even the Novel Foods Committee. In 1994, just as they were clearing GM soya, Monsanto was telling the government that by the time it reached Britain, it would be mixed up with ordinary soya beans. Since soy is used in half the processed foods we eat, that meant it would be almost impossible to avoid. He wouldn't know what food it was in. Even members of the committee that had passed it were alarmed. That was absolutely appalling. There was a huge level of frustration, not only from consumers, but from manufacturers, from retailers, all of whom joined together to be concerned about the fact that choice had been 
gone out of the window in terms of soya. But that was not the remit of, uh, of the committee. The committee just said this is a safe product. Did um, we ever talk about it privately? Or? Oh, yes, of course. But, I mean, but not absolutely. officially? Just but not officially within the and committee. And what did you say privately? Well, privately, we were all very angry indeed, including the scientists. Angry with? Angry with Monsanto, I suppose. <laughs> It's the regulatory bodies that approve food safety that decide whether the food products need to be separated. But you could have insisted, you could have insisted that they were kept separate. Well, I don't think we can. We don't have an influence on what uh, food manufacturers and suppliers do. Um, we only have a, an influence at the seed supply end. But you could have told the people who are using the seed, the farmers, keep these separate, plant them separately. But it, that's a decision for the regulators, and, and, and it's based on whether there's any difference. And if there's no difference, then why should um, anybody be told to keep separate any more than we do in any other uh, crops at the moment? Few consumers knew it, but behind the scenes, a huge row had broken out. During 1995, some supermarkets, like Sainsbury's, were contacting suppliers to try and avoid the GM soya. They fought a rearguard action to try and have the GM beans segregated so they could be labelled. We petitioned the main American company involved in genetically modified soya, which is Monsanto. We petitioned the UK government. We sent information to the American Soybean Growers Association. We sent information to the American government. Everybody that we could contact, we said, we want it segregated so we can provide choice. And what happened? Well, they listened intently and we had numerous meetings across a period of 18 months to two years. But in the end, it appeared that they didn't listen to what was wanted here in the UK and in Europe because they didn't segregate. While the row went on, another committee was sitting, whose very job it was to decide if foods like GM should be labelled. The Food Advisory Committee. In fact, they'd been considering it since 1990. They too are mostly scientific and industry experts, with a couple of lay members to represent consumers. In 1993, after holding a formal consultation, the committee concluded that there was not a strong enough case to insist on labeling GM foods. The committee at that time, I think, felt that it could crowd out other information and that if somebody somewhere insisted on labels being on every single product, the labels would become devalued. We'd just stop reading them because there were so many labels about. But didn't you accept that this is what people wanted to know, whether it was GM or not? Uh, I do not recall that at that time people wanted to know that. I think the committee was well ahead of public concerns in looking into GM. Most of those consulted did not recommend labelling. In 1993, in its submission to the FAC, Tesco explained why they thought it would be better if GM ingredients were not spelt out on labels. They said an unbearable labelling regime would lead to adverse customer perception of the product and could be detrimental to the marketing of safe products. But we've learned that as far back as 1993, Credible voices like the National Farmers Union and the British Medical Association had urged the committee to label. We were extremely concerned. We felt it was essential that food be labelled so that the public could choose whether or not to eat these products and know what they were eating. And we also believed that this would raise consumer confidence rather than hiding the information from the public. But those voices were not heeded. In 1995, the FAC decided that since the Novel Foods Committee had said GM soya was equivalent to non-GM soya, it didn't need special labelling. A year later, it confirmed that decision, saying labelling along the lines of may contain GM soya derivatives was not likely to be very informative to consumers. Hiding information raises suspicions, and we have to recognize that the last 20 years has been full of stories of scares and fears about foods, some of which have been justified, and in many of the cases, the justification has also been about the way information has been hidden. The basic allegation is that you didn't allow people to choose because you didn't insist that GM products were labelled in processed foods and you denied people of the right to choose. That is enormously pejorative. I've never heard that allegation until you uttered it and it's nonsense. But Tesco, who are now labelling all genetically modified ingredients, admit that initially they'd got it wrong. In those early days there were some opinions that were wrong. 
I think uh, our ideas of what customers wanted and uh, didn't want, you know, have evolved from then. Um, I mean, there's never intention to be dishonest. Uh, I think that's, the, you know, that's the absolute the, the truth there. Uh, but our, our views on that quickly changed. Six weeks ago, that's nearly 10 years since the question of whether to label GM foods was first discussed by the government's own committee, a new law on labelling some GM products was finally announced. But even now, not everything made from a GM crop has to be labelled. It's the job of trading standards officers like Richard Brooks to be the new label police. But he's finding the power the law now gives him still doesn't go far enough for some. Food must be labelled if it contains altered DNA from GM crops. But if food is derived from GM plants and then refined and purified to take the genetic material out, as in soya or corn oil, say, it doesn't have to be labelled at all. Well, this uh, corn oil, for example, um, I don't know whether it was made from um, genetically modified corn, um, but even if it were, it wouldn't have to be labelled um, because, the, the because the oil doesn't contain any um, protein or DNA and, and as such it wouldn't have to be labelled. It's so refined that it doesn't contain the GM ingredients? Yes, by the time it's, uh, the stuff that's been extracted doesn't contain those, those ingredients. And under the new EC law that means it doesn't need to be labelled? That's correct. Why would anybody want it labelled if it doesn't have the GM ingredients? Because a lot of consumers who are concerned about the environment or have uh, ethical concerns about um, genetic modification would like to know that when they're making their purchasing decisions. It's these environmental and ethical concerns that have been growing. There's a great sense of uncertainty about what could happen to our countryside with its already delicate environmental balance if genetically altered material is released into our natural surroundings. Nature can fight back in a completely unpredictable way. Um, we know that again and again and again, we're here because of evolution. The plants are out there because of evolution. Evolution needs raw material, mutations, which it picks up and uses in the most startling ways. We're giving it raw material it's never had before from the most astonishingly distant parts of the living world. It seems to me quite foolish to suggest that evolution, natural selection, isn't going to pick it up and utilize it. Um, and we're not going to like that because that is going to happen. New genetic material is now present in the British countryside in the form of GM farm-scale crop trials. The government's putting over three million pounds into test sites like Lush Hill. The trials are supposed to be kept separate from other crops by a distance of between 50 to 200 meters. But that isolation can be rendered meaningless by the activities of bees or wind, carrying the pollen from the GM trial over to neighboring fields. Farmers like Pete Richardson know that bees don't observe no-fly zones. His organic farm is near the trial crop, and he worries that possible cross-pollination from the GM plants could put him out of business. The Soil Association have told us that um, they're going to monitor the situation with farms close to the um, genetically modified field trials and um, see if any cross-contamination um, takes place. If this is the case, they, ca they have every right to withdraw our symbol and this will jeopardise our livelihood. But the company at the forefront of GM technology are not so worried about what cross-pollination might do. You're putting genes into the environment in places where they were not naturally found, and that's playing a kind of roulette with nature. I mean, isn't it? Can you be sure that you really know the long term hazards of what you're doing? No, you, we, we've always changed genetics of crops, changed the genetic makeup of crops through breeding. There's nothing essentially any different from this. But, well, there is, because you're putting genes in new places, aren't you? And you don't always know exactly where you're putting them. No, I mean, nature has many ways of changing genetic structure itself in the soil and so forth. So there's nothing inherently different about this. But some argue that in any trial in the open, cross-pollination simply cannot be controlled. And clearer, more consistent rules for farm trials are now being urged on the government. There's no reason why we should not be able to have in place uh, systems which are, are robust and which safeguard. But no robust system is going to control the bees, is it? You, well, you uh, just can't do it. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we're going to control bees, uh, but we can take appropriate safeguards to uh, prevent uh, these issues which concern people of potential cross pollination. Potential cross pollination, you think the risk is there? 
Well, uh, nothing is risk-free in life, is it? We don't, we don't live in a risk-free world. The other rake on the top of the hill... But we've learned the...